deny what he's doing. He seems like he's doing a, a fabulous job in trying to get things in place and creating opportunities for all people. Right. Um, do I think that he has black America on the forefront of his mind? I don't think he really has right, right now, and right. I don't really think he can for that matter. Right. Um, that is something that's going to be up to us to do, to qualif qualify ourselves to have a voice. And uh, I think that's probably one of the things that all of us are looking at. What's he going to do for black people? Mm -hmm. That's what the Caucasian is probably looking at. That's what we're looking at. And there's nothing he can do for us unless we do it for ourselves. Right. Absolutely. All right, now I'm going to read this first paragraph, then I'm going to uh, get your thoughts. <clears throat> But Askia begins, after eight years of open hostility, warfare, and deteriorating relations between Muslims throughout the world and the American people, a president of the United States called for a new beginning, a rebirth of friendship and mutual respect between America and the Muslim world. And this is a quote from Brother Obama. I've come here to Cairo to seek a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world, one based on mutual interest and mutual respect, said President Barack Hussein Obama June 4th in an address hosted jointly by Cairo University and the 1,000-year-old Al-Azhar University, which was viewed live by tens of millions of Muslims and other people around the world. Um, I'm going to go on a little bit further. From his opening breath in which he offered the goodwill of the American people and a greeting of peace from Muslim communities in my country, assalamu alaikum, through his frequent ref references to the Islamic sacred text, the Holy Quran, as well as with anecdotes from his own personal life, Mr. Obama sought to be a bridge between the two worlds, reciting rhetoric not unlike that which the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and other representatives of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad have been preaching in this country for nearly 80 years. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to <laughs> stop <laughs> yes, because, <clears throat> you know, it was very notable that, you know, like Brother points out in the article, uh, when Barack was delivering his address, his pronunciation and his enunciation of the words uh, in Arabic, like he didn't call it, he didn't say Muslims, or he said Muslim. He yes. didn't say the Koran, he said Quran. Yes, sir. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he reflected on his childhood. What were your thoughts on uh, President Obama's delivery and, you know, just what he said during that speech. I think it was an opportunity to really teach people that we have a common denominator mm -hmm. uh, in America and in the Muslim world, and that is we need freedom, justice, and equality for all people. Right. And the beautiful thing about him is that he has experience in Islam. Doesn't make him a Muslim, but he knows about it. Right. And that being said, what better person can actually bridge the gap between the Islamic world and America? When you have America, we have a, a, a nice core group of Muslims in America that was grown by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So therefore, we definitely would have a voice right. and we have a say so. We were affected with 911 just like the Islamic world overseas was affected with 911. So what better person could we have today to get out there and try to close the gap between the Islamic world and the United States. Right. Hmm. Um, you know, just in looking over this article and just reflecting over the past eight years uh, with uh, President George um, W. Bush and how negative uh, the feelings were towards Muslims from his administration, right. and especially after 911 and the subsequent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, I mean, for a president to speak out to the Muslim world in this manner is, you know, somewhat unheard of. That's right. You know, with this, uh, with this, um, you know, with the government and the, the history that the government has had towards Islam. What do you think that the uh, future holds for American and Muslim relations with a president like uh, Barack Well, the Obama? one thing for certain, this has to happen. Reason being is 
It's about opportunity. It's about business. And when you have business and opportunity, at some point, you're going to want to meet with the people you want to do business with. Well, past presidents have more or less forced themselves to do business in the way in which they decided to do. Right. And one thing for certain about the Islamic world, you just can't go in there and just do whatever you want because their law, Islamic law, is based off Sharia, which is the law of the Quran. Right. Whereas in America, you have laws that are governed and made by men, not based on the standard of Bible like it was when this, planet, when this country was found. But you have to have somebody that's willing to do business the Islamic way. And that is you have witnesses, and that is you actually sit down and you find the common denominator between both countries and figure out a solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. what, what do we want from the Middle East? What does the Middle East want from us? And to, to have an attitude that we don't really care what you are, we're going to tell you what to do in your country and we don't care what you want to do, that's not going to work. Right. And this will cause a catastrophic storm, if you will, between two countries. And that's exactly what's happened. Hmm. They've created a storm for Americans that hate Muslims and Muslims that hate America when all you have to do is just really sit down and have discussion. Right. And that's why we have the UN. And that's why we have all these different things in government because we're supposed to sit down and have quality dialogue between right. both countries so we can actually find solutions that would help not only us, but help them as well. Yes, sir. Now, you know, just in perusing through this article, uh, just a few highlights from uh, Barack's speech. As a student of history, I also know civilization's debt to Islam. It was Islam at places like Al-Azhar that carried the light of learning through so many centuries, paving the way for Europe's renaissance and enlightenment. Mm -hmm. I know, too, that Islam has always been a part of America's story. The first nation to recognize my country was Morocco. In signing the Treaty of Tripoli in 1796, our second president, John Adams, wrote, the United States has in itself no character of enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of Muslims. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, in my opinion, you know, Barack's, uh, uh, you know, really proved that he was well read, and it really just highlighted That's his right. brilliance to bring up, you know, that Islamic history That's in right. a speech like this. What, how far do you think this goes in changing the uh, view? of Americans towards Islam when their president makes a speech like this? Well, it creates a, a great awareness of something that this country has really hidden for quite some time. You know, you have Thomas Jefferson who swore in on the Quran when he became president. And most, if not all, presidents have a great history with Islam, dealing with the organizations that they actually qualify themselves to be in when they become president, if not before. Right. And this is what is hidden. And this is what you won't learn in school. This is what you won't learn necessarily in uh, major universities. This is something that you actually have to dig and study yourselves. What is America's biggest fear of Islam? Mm -hmm. Well, I would, my opinion would say that Islam built this country. And not in the aspect of where we think of the stereotypical idea of Islam, where you have a woman walking behind you five feet all these different things. If you study Islam and the laws of economics and everything else, it is the greatest dynamic of control and to be just for a nation. Mm -hmm. We don't have usury in Islam. We don't have the interest rate. So therefore, you know, you never create debt. Right. And that's what this country was founded on. They didn't have interest rates. America controlled their money. You know, it was in 1914 when they lost the control right. of their money. So. It's these different types of things that creates awareness for our people and for the American people in general to go out and research and find out what is the history of American and Islam. So I think that's beautiful. That's what, you know, that, that he spoke out and actually named, especially somebody going far back as John Quincy Adams in 1796, that had a history with Islam. Right. So it creates that awareness and education for people to go out and say, well, what is the big deal? Right. So let's go find out. And I think that's, uh, that was the key to that whole lecture and, and, and I think that it